we want to get started. We want to just get started. This is has been one good week. I I want to say on my part, God has been so merciful. God has been so faithful. And I'm just glad to see everybody are near. God bless you for being around Zorina. God bless you. Okay, Ania, he dropped off. I think, did I see Mohammed? Um, Michael Mohammed? It's all good. So we want to get into this evening's teachings. And um, I've been told not to say what I'm going to say. That is, very often I'll say, oh, it's a short teaching. And it's going to be very, very short. And all of that promise. But at the end of the day, it doesn't turn out to be short. <laughs> Just a moment. Um, okay, good. Yeah. I'm having... Good. I need to take this off. So I trust your week has been good. I trust work has been fluid. I trust that the Lord is bringing us into his unfolding purposes each day of our lives. It's amazing what God can do. Um, God has, I'm, I'm, I'm personally blown away because of the things that God keep doing around us. And I'll share one testimony uh, about this week. So I want to just get into the teachings. We would do well to pick up from where we stop. And we've been looking at rediscovering God's ecclesia. Uh, issues of how we can bring our faith into where we live, where we work, where we play. That the Bible will describe, among many other things, that it alludes to as an active faith, as a faith that is alive, as a faith that is engaging, as a pure faith, that it's not a faith that is stuck or stomped on one particular trend but it's a faith that is symbiotic, that is able to touch different um, multi-layered aspects of life. Faith that is brought into the context of where we live, where we work, where we play, whatever we do. That it is not a schizophrenic faith, something that we take up um, on Sunday morning and we drop it off Monday at dawn, we dust it up again, sometime within the week of a situation called midweek service. And then we drop it off and we pick it up on another Sunday morning. This is the world we have stepped into. This is the life we have embraced. So we are looking at how that faith can be strategized properly and can be activated and installed in the various environments that we find ourselves in. Being it, I'm a, I'm, I'm a professional working from an environment that requires a certain level of alacrity, or being it, I'm lying um, in, the, in the beautiful sands in somewhere, Hawaii. This thing is alive and active. Whether I'm in the middle of the ocean, the kingdom of God, the ecclesial life, it's a never ending stream of life that we carry and express. So we are saying that Ecclesia everywhere. That is a concept um, we want to lock in on. Ecclesia everywhere. Ecclesia showing in every aspect of our lives. And so we want to say communities that are on mission. Okay, so let's look at some of the things we look at last week real quick. We started looking just into this and then we ended. We said Ecclesia without walls. Ecclesia everywhere means Ecclesia without walls. And we said that we wanted to consider these three things. Number one, that the Ecclesia will be brought into our home and our neighborhoods. Something we describe um, in person as kingdom sanctuaries. Then we also want to say the Ecclesia in the marketplace. 
the ecclesia in the marketplace. Then also, ecclesia, how do we install it in our kingdom communities? These are the realities we want to consider in this last part or uh, part of the series that we are looking at under ecclesia. So we started off and we talked about this briefly that church leaders of the future ought to assume their original pivotal functional position and role as equippers among the relational matrices, the dynamics that they engage in, they are supposed to, or we are supposed to look at ourselves as equippers. And essentially that is what we are. Helping people to bring their faith more deeply into their homes, neighborhoods, a workplace, than being entertainers, than being the Christ for them but than being the Christ for them. So we went through all of this and I'm not going to go through all of that. I just want to come to the very slide. The very slide we stopped on. Okay, so I think we, we stopped we stopped somewhere on this slide. Yes, this is a slide we stopped on. We said, Jesus has instructed us to go into the world. And therefore the world is more than just this physical world, but it's all encompassing. It touches every facet of humanity. And we concluded by saying that there is nothing like a bad or corrupt business or manufacturing company or a bank until corrupt people or human beings are found there. We said the corruption of a system is perpetuated by corrupt human beings. Therefore, we said your systems are as pure and wonderful as the people who run it. So we concluded on this very note that do not change structures and systems until you have changed values. I don't know if it was on this call I was talking and I was saying that if we're not careful, we will see all kinds of things on our, in our streets because of the way our governments behave. We will see it in South Africa, we'll see it in Ghana and all. We need to pray for South Africa because when you look at the ethos, I mean, the entire configuration that, that drove just um, the route that broke out on Monday or Sunday night or something, and that lasted for about two or three days. And even to today, uh, there are still some small pockets of looting here and there. You would realize and, and uh, or even ask yourself, do, where is the church? Where is the body of Christ? And it is in Nigeria, it is in Ghana. The things that happen, we begin to ask, where is the body of Christ? Two stories quickly that jumps at me. Um, I think there's in church history is a guy called Evans Robert. Evans Robert experienced a move of God in Scotland so powerfully that uh, at some point they had to begin to lay off the police force because there was no crime to police. There was no longer crime to police. There is a guy called Maldonado Gililamo. Gililamo Maldonado, one of those. Uh, his first name is either Gililamo Maldonado, or Gil Gililamo, and the last name is Maldonado. I think he's somewhere in Miami. One time he was speaking on a platform in his um, meeting and he said, there shall not be any crime in California for the next one month. And it went on record as such. I listened to his testimonies. My dear friends, we, we have stepped into a certain space that is called the very life of God um, introduced into our environment. That is ecclesial life we have to begin to design life for impact. So we have to be, begin to plan for impact. We can't leave things to the spirit anymore, anymore. We have to install the ecclesia right. We have to express it right. So the first thing I want to say about planning for impact is that we have to be deliberate and plan for impact. I want you to just um, think about that in a moment. 
Think about that in a moment. We have to be deliberate and plan for impact. I am leading a spiritual organization. If I say organism, let me use organism, a group of people, and we are reaching out for um, ex expansion of the kingdom. What I need to do is to be deliberate and plan for impact. Deliberate in the relationships that I build. Deliberate in the kind of activities and program that I initiate within my environment. Deliberate in every single sphere of our operations, relational dynamics. Deliberate in how, what we teach and how we teach it. We have to be deliberate and plan for impact. We have to look for spaces and step into those spaces because they are calling for attention. So planning for impact. So let's ask ourselves a few questions and we can even open the uh, microphones and begin to engage here and, and talk to one another. The question is, if we're going to be deliberate to plan for impact in installing the Ecclesia, how do we bring the culture of the kingdom into different systems? mentalities, cultures, people, environment, etc., and build it as it is in heaven. Remember, we looked at Matthew chapter 28, the verse, the verse 18 through 20, where Jesus said, go into the world. Mark chapter 16, 15 says, go into the world. John chapter 3, the verse 16 and 17 says, he, the son of God, was sent to save the world. That through him, the world will not be condemned, but the world will be salvaged. The world will be restored. That there will be a deliverance. There will be a salvation happening to the world. Let's ask ourselves, how do we deliberately bring the culture of the kingdom into different systems? Different societies, different mentalities, different cultures, different environments. This does not appear to look like what church is presently, if you begin to introduce these questions. Um, I think it was one of the live sessions on Facebook, one of the Sundays, and I said this. I think the second um, well-known language today in earth is Midrian. For example, in Ghana, we are bordered um, we are surrounded by French speaking countries on all the borders. When you go down to the north is Burkina Faso and it's French speaking, Islamic, Muslim and French speaking. You go down to Ivory Coast, French speaking. You go down to Togo, which is just south here, French speaking. And we have a church that has not got even any single plan to to make an incursion, an invasion, to create an impact. So our children in Sunday school, for example, are just being taught this whole um, something. It is all good, it is fine, but we need to press beyond that level. We need to position the children for, for, for the future. I had my last French classes in class one. Our churches today have abandoned um, certain aspects of development when we ought to be the very hub, the very epitome, the very epicenter of total development of man and value system of our society. So it is, it requires that we begin to ask ourselves within um, our local kingdom communities, within our families, how do I, or how do we bring the culture of the kingdom into different systems, mentalities, uh, cultures and people, environment, etc., and to build it as it is in heaven. This is a very important question we ought to be thinking about. And if you have answers, how glad I am. I want to listen to your opinion because um, we have the mind of Christ. God has blessed us with wisdom. Some of the things that you may be doing within your context may be transferable or may just be altered a little and boom, the spirit of God setting things on edge. The second question is, what kind of philosophy must undergird your our personal lives? Our personal corporate existence and trust, the kind of thing we do. 
what should be the philosophy. We must have very strong, potent philosophies that drive us, other than the current philosophy, pervaded philosophy that um, exists. I have been told severally that if I continue to preach this kind of message uh, that I preach, I will not have anybody in my, <laughs> my community. I'm like, really, every single person ought to be equipped with the same material, the same resource. In John chapter 10, verse 16, it says that other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will be in one fold, they will be under one shepherd, they will hear one voice. We can distill truth of high voltage and, and, and pass it on even to the granular level within our structures, within the very granular level of our structures. So the question is, what philosophy must undergird our personal, corporate existence and trust? What should be the philosophy? What must be driving us? What must be the guiding principle, ethos upon which life is built? So if you have some answers, please take note of them because we can talk about these things and we need to, we need to open the lines a bit. We talk about them before I start stating the very first activation and installation um, principle. Question is, what type of teaching or teachings must, be, must we introduce? What type of teaching or teachings must we introduce? What type of teaching? I spoke in a church some few years back, I think either 2018 um, yeah, 2018. And so this was a testimony for which the pastor invited me. Um, I had ministered in a friend's, a friend's meeting um, that same month or so. And it happened that the very first day, the meeting was um, prevailing under a different atmosphere. The second day, it was a different atmosphere manifestation of God in the meeting. The third day, was a different one as well. And so the first day, one of the things that happened, several significant things, but one of the things that happened was, um, I, I, I started praying for the sick and a gentleman came forward. So the Lord began to minister to me about a relationship he has had before and, and had a child with a woman. And now he has moved on and married another woman. And the, 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 the let's say the old woman, um, the other woman was cursing him. As a result, um, he was facing stagnation in life. So I told him all these things. While I was talking to him, another vision and, and an encounter of God jumped at me, in which um, I began to talk about a death incident that has happened in the family. And that thing was going to repeat again. And the source, um, the Lord revealed, the Lord revealed who was behind it, and the name and blah, 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 blah. And then I said, the thing is going to repeat itself again. And then he said, yes, uh, it is so, so, and so, and so, and so, exactly as I said. And um, uh, tomorrow he would like to bring the family of the man who had passed on to the meeting. So imagine standing in front of an auditorium to your extreme right, the next day, the gentleman is sitting to your extreme left, um, there are several people sitting, these are over hundreds of people sitting in this auditorium. And to your left, um, um, the, the family that he promised to bring happened to be sitting to, to my left. So whilst I was ministering, um, the Spirit of God just led me. Long story short, I will not tell you how it all happened. But it was, okay, let me say it. it. It may leave an impact and an impression on somebody and may bring a, a spiritual hunger. It was as though a hand, a hand notched me from the back of my neck and turned me when I was actively ministering to somebody and, and directed me. I mean, I was just moved and I started walking towards the left um, side of the auditorium and towards the back. And I went straight to this woman. I said, woman, why are you sleeping? You are experiencing a lot of gout in your body, a lot of pain in your body. She said, yes, she said, yes. And I said, listen to me, a death incident has happened in your home. And that thing is about to repeat itself again. And it's going, to, it's going to be terrible. 
And this woman, I mean, you see the spirit of death manifest and this woman was scattering things. She was almost running out of the auditorium to go and either do something to herself or so. Um, several, several, several things, powerful meeting. And so this pastor friend of mine told the other pastor that, come on, something happened in our meeting this time again. And you need to have Mark in your meeting. So he invited me and I went. And, and this is it. He expected me, this preacher who invited me, expected me to come and just come and scream, the Lord will bless you, the Lord will favor you, the Lord will do this, and all of that. And unfortunately, unfortunately to um, his disappointment and to the disappointment of his congregation, I didn't come to preach that way. I came to talk about shifting the clouds in the territory and how the church was facing certain battles. And those were acknowledgeable things among them, but they didn't appreciate the ministration. As a result, he doesn't want to have anything to do with me. He doesn't want to, he doesn't even like anything I post on Facebook. He doesn't want me in his meeting again. In fact, when I was leaving that, they said, you know, my people, they like these kind of messages. The Lord will bless you. The Lord will bless you. The Lord will bless you. But what is the very essence of bringing the people of God together and only to come and tell that the Lord will bless you when the power of commanded blessings lies at the very, very cross, the very foundation and the unleashing of man when man had done absolutely nothing. I mean, blessing is an embodiment of our existence. We cannot separate man from blessing. And so the search for blessing is not the biggest game today that ought to be prevented. But unfortunately, that is the trend. In my country, that is the kind of preaching that is, is lovely. It's that kind of preaching, that kind of, um, that, that, that um, um, exalts the flesh and excites the flesh. Something to the, to, to the extent of being called the prosperity gospel. So if you are teaching something, otherwise it is not embraced. So the question is this, what type of or types of teaching must we introduce? What types? So if I am in the capacity of a leader of a community, I am driven by this. I'm asking these questions. What kind of food do I set on the table? Jesus told the parable of a faithful servant who knows how and when the, the, the other servant needs to eat in season and out of season. And he serves and he waits on the master's master himself. He says that one will be put in charge of many, will be put in charge of, of greater good. So what type of teaching, what food must be served on the table? Wisdom is justified by her children. Wisdom is justified by her children. There's a need that we begin to unleash strong building components in terms of teaching, in terms of developing people, in terms of deliberately picking each individual and developing them and, and relating the grace of God upon our lives if we are in that capacity as equippers to impact and drive forward their very call. So the question is, what kind of believer must I become? In looking at the nature of Ecclesia, we must be deliberate and plan for impact. So what kind of believer must I become in my society? What kind of believer? Today, uh, in many places, if you do not, if you do not attend a, a, a church meeting, a church meeting on Sunday, it is almost as if you, 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 you are not born again. That's the way the feeling is. That's the way the feeling is. But it, it has to die and give way to a very matured, conscious existence. What kind of believer must I become? Will I be that believer that has a schizophrenic standard, one standard applicable at home, one standard applicable when I am in a church meeting, one standard applicable when I am at work. There are a lot of great men who are very powerful in church meetings, the gathering of the family, but never powerful at home, who will carry the pastor's briefcase, but will never, never carry their wife's briefcase. There are a lot of powerful women who will honor a, a, a pastor and never honor their husbands. What kind of believer must I become? A lot of powerful believers who honor preachers, pastors, but do not have not learned the principle of the, 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 the promise of God, the commandment of God that comes with blessing. It says, honor your father 
and your mother for this is right, that you may live long. You may live long. That my father can be in tatters, but I can, I can clothe, I can clothe a preacher. I can just clothe a preacher. I can just lavishly. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about um, somebody who, who is, is giving in a balance. I'm talking about somebody who is just off, completely off. There are a lot of them. There are a lot of them who would dishonor their, their fathers. What kind of believer must I become? What principle of honor must I uphold in relating to um, um, leaders and people of the community that um, I, I, I live in? I mean, the kingdom or spiritual community that I live, I live in. How, how must I be? What kind of believer must I be? Is a very important place we need to come to. So planning for impact, planning for impact. We have to be deliberate and really plan for impact. The question is what type of church must, must be crafted in the earth? If we are to truly see the kingdom of God come, what type of church? What type of church? What type of church? In many places, I think Idahosa said something. It says that if your pastor only makes you to clap your hands, listen to a nice sermon, give a big offering, nice offering, and then he makes you go home. He says, run for your dear life. It is not a, a safe place to be. So what kind of kingdom communities must we become? Communities, for example, so, uh, there's a lady in Ghana who, um, I don't know where we all got this celebrity thing from, uh, because all of us are celebrities. Um, Veronica is a celebrity. Veronica is a star. Kelvin is a star. Mark is a star. We are all stars in our right. But unfortunately, we, we, we tend to arrogate that star level to some peculiar people and they become kind of demigods and they make money out, out of that. Um, this lady, supposedly celebrity, um, who, who is said to have become born again, I understand somebody has deceived her that everything she acquired when she was in the world, she sold them off, including her clothes. And bless, bless the ministry. I don't want to say bless the church. Bless the ministry. What kind of church must we become? What kind of people must we become in the earth? When we look at nations building, what kind of church must we become? Must we become a church that only prays the solution or a church that also, or, or, or also releases a solution? There's one of the churches in Ghana, I use that word um, carefully, church. There's one of the churches in Ghana, they have developed, I think, a 20-year plan in that they want, to, they want to release politicians from their kingdom community who will infiltrate and become MPs, uh, members of parliament who will make laws and influence the society. 20 year plan. So it's deliberately going to be how they develop their people, what kind of language they speak to them, what sort of thinking or slant of thinking is structured into their construct. All of these things, what kind of church must we become if we're truly going to see the kingdom of God come? Going to be that church that we just pray and say, let there be solution and never get involved and build, or we are going to be a church who will be fretting over all the vacuums that exist and begin to look for the opportunity to step into them and provide solution. What system, systems must be built by the church to engage with the different worlds, to engage with the different worlds and kingdoms of this world around us for colonization? We have to uphold that world colonization. It must live in our intent that God set us here to colonize, to colonize, to teach this world, how to dress, how to talk, how to behave like heaven. The nations of the earth will have to find their true destiny and identity in us. What kind of systems? What kind of systems? Today, many of the, the churches that have schools are operating basically like 
every other secular school. But can't we do something different? And in the midst of teaching the very secular things that they teach, bring a very strong kingdom trust to all that is done. What kind of systems that must be built? These are questions that I'm throwing out there so um, we can discuss, we can get into it. So what should be our strategy? There is a need that we have to engage new evangelism strategies. New evangelism strategies. Crusades are no longer doing it. Crusades with all the long, big trail are no longer doing it. I mean, um, permanently with the, with the ethos that it is only in the auditorium that people can be equipped, will no longer do it. We must begin to open certain new channels. We must begin to establish strong physical bases from which we can begin to launch out and touch the world around us. We need serious training hubs online, serious training hubs, courses, programs that can be written and put online for people to assess and run at their own pace. We need to begin to speak a language, very strong ethical language that interfaces with the world that does not understand our hallelujahs. Jesus Christ is revealed in the book of Psalm. I just want to read um, a couple of them. Psalm 110, and this is a very popular Psalm. Look at what it says. We are here for colonization. Psalm 110, the verse one through three. It says that the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sent the rod of your strength out of Zion. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the beauty of holiness, from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. It says the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof and all that dwells in it. What kind of systems must we, must we begin to engage? New evangelism strategies we must begin to think about. The construct of pure love must begin to reach out. I think this could be the last question on this. How do we intentionally, deliberately position the individual, our work, our businesses, our careers, our skills, our individual ministries and corporate ministries now and for future impact. How do we do that? These are things we need to sit down, deliberately think about, beta test them in our hearts, in our little environment and continue to test them. Try um, the concept of the sunken project where um, the straw man idea is positioned against the still my idea and the straw my idea collapses and falls apart, but the still my idea continue to stand. We have to work it out and work it out until we have refined approaches to things. What must we do? How do we position the individuals, our business, our work, our ministries for now and for future impact? Ecclesia without war. So from this slide, I'm going to begin to deal with the first Installation principle, Ecclesia in the neighborhood, Christ in the neighborhood, Ecclesia in our homes, kingdom sanctuaries. That will be the very first one I will be dealing with. So before we proceed, if any of us have any thoughts, anything you want to, you want to just mention as we went through those questions, please just um, feel free, unmute your microphone and share some ideas. Kelvin, over to you, sir. Yes, Mark. Thank you very much. Could you go back to the first screen? Okay, let Can me. Can you go back to your first screen? Yes, yeah. let me do that. 
Um, let's do it this way. Okay, so, okay, so, um, here we are. Yeah. This, yeah. Yeah, so this one. Yeah. Oh, good, good, good. Okay, so let me populate them. Yeah, so this is the first slide for the questions. Yes. These things really deeply, deeply impacted me because the first thing I thought about to even try to engage with this level of, we talk about impact, mm. to deliberate, uh, how to be deliberate, to plan for impact. Well, the impact is going to come from, from God, the Holy Spirit. So I need to find out from him what does he plan to accomplish and partner with him mm. regarding his will and his purpose. Mm. Um, oh my goodness, this was really, you know, looking at the culture of the kingdom into different systems. And when we talk about dealing with the world, we are dealing with a system. And before, it was all about bringing the gospel to the people. Just bring the gospel to them because they need to be saved. Mm -hmm. Now in our, I think it must've been in another slide about the evangelism. Our evangelism has to be more strategic because like Jesus did, when Jesus met the woman at the well, he first of all removed his disciples. Mm -hmm. He sent them to go and get food that he really wasn't interested in. So he could deal with this woman and he, he did not start teaching to her, talking to her about the kingdom. He talked to her about water. Mm. He talked to her about her thirst. Mm. He talked to her about, you know, her, her religious experience and all those kinds of things and all of her history and things like that to get to the core of her need. And so Jesus was a listener. He was an observer. Mm. So rather than to come in with a floodlight mm. of what I believe people need, I need to back up and find out what does God want to accomplish? What is his desire? Mm. What does he want to do? Mm. You know, I, I can't assume those things. Now, mm -hmm. as for me and my part personally, I want to make sure that I am pure, wow. that I'm clean, that I am, mm. I'm, I am, I'm available for God to use, that I have a responsibility uh, of um, being intentionally deliberate uh, about my lifestyle. Paul told Timothy, um, give heed to yourself and to your doctrine. Wow. Give heed to yourself and to your doctrine. So two things, right? Give heed to the, what you're being taught, uh, heed to yourself, how you live, and to what you're being taught. And so. This is really, really, um, really exciting. I'm, I'm very, very, very challenged by this. I am, um, it's causing me to think, it's causing me to rethink um, even things that I believe about what is possible. And I can't wait until you get into the neighborhood because that's exactly where I'm positioned right now. I'm mm -hmm. looking right now out of the window of a house that has about four men that, that share this place. And um, I'm, my heart really goes out to them. And I want to, I want to impact it. I was talking to one gentleman yesterday. I was taking the trash out yesterday and he was just coming in from work and um, he's always busy and I never really get a chance to talk to him, but I just want to befriend these guys. I want to, I don't want to come in as a know-it-all. Mm -hmm. I want to listen to them. I want to be their friend. I want to find out if they have any prayer needs, if, um, are they doing okay? Be interested in their lives, you know, be interested in them as people and not trying to show them where they're wrong and how they need to change. Mm. Mm. And, and getting a strategy from God. So yeah, Mark, this, this right here, I'm telling you already, you've given me enough to really go back to God and say, Lord, what is your plan for me in helping? Number one, I can't do it alone. Mm -hmm. So now I have to collaborate with brothers and sisters, right? I can't do it alone I, and I shouldn't want to do it alone and I need God to accomplish it. This is his, he's inviting us onto his stage. This isn't me, this isn't asking me, asking God to come onto my stage. 
he's inviting me on to his stage, right? That's right. So, so those are the things that I'm really looking at. So I'm so glad you're bringing this up and I'm so glad I'm here. And my heart just says yes to the Lord. And I'm not even sure what all of that means, but I'm mm -hmm. available, mm -hmm. I'm available. Mm -hmm. so, so thank you so much. Well, that is very powerful. Let me just make this comment before anybody else uh, come in. Uh, Mary said, be it unto me according to your word. I mean, you, Mary, um, you are receiving a word and this word is going to produce a situation in which you wouldn't have met a man and you're going to have a baby. And uh, the consequences are grave because you could be stoned to death. And so Mary says, well, um, let it be unto me according to the power of your word, the consequences that comes with it, I embrace it all. And uh, it's a very good place. And that is what I hear in Kevin's last statement, that we, uh, some of the things we may not readily be able to appreciate. Them. And I feel that this particular slide, when I'm done, I'm going to send it out. I, I feel that this particular um, today's presentation and even that of last week, I'm going to send it out and share it with everybody. If um, these are questions that we can continue to ruminate on and prayerfully engage them. Personally, before I came back from Nigeria to Ghana, um, one of the questions I started asking God, um, you asked that I go back and start a work, but what is your strategy? Because I'm, I, I, I just can't come and do everybody doing it the same way. And eventually what we design into is, is um, this copy copying um, kind of life and unhealthy and ministry competition. Um, K is doing, the, doing it this way, he's succeeding. So I'm also going to do it that way and five steps towards church growth and this and that and that and that and that. And that thing, it just kills my spirit. So I, I just spent time asking God, how should I do it? What should I do? What should be my strategy? And um, it continues to unfold every now and then. It continues to unfold every now and then. So Kevin, that is a very powerful thought you just shared. Be it unto me according to your word. I receive it with the consequence that comes with it. I receive it with the severity that comes with it. I receive it with the intensity, the power, the grace, the resource that comes with it. I receive it because it's placing a demand on me to be, to be pure, to be holy. And so I keep repudiating myself. I stumble and fall. I have to rise quickly because his grace is extending out to me and he's cleaning me, he's, he's washing me, He's making me draw closer so I can be empowered to continue to live for him. Really powerful thoughts, Kevin. Really, really powerful thoughts. Anybody else want to share something? What kind of believer must I become? You are free. You can unmute your microphone and just pronounce a few things. What kind of, Veronica, let me just speak to you. What kind of music must I do? I keep telling the guys, the guys in our ministry. I said, you guys stop copying people. Be you. Originality sells. Just be yourself. When you sing somebody's song, make it your own. Sing it from the depth of your experience with God. And not trying to mimic the person and his spiritual experiences. Sometimes we try to do all this choreographed thing and try to create the very ambience we saw in the video. And we experience death. I just want to be me. I don't want to sing like anybody. I just want to be me. I don't want to preach like anybody. I just want my environment. When we talk about, about the gathering of our community, I just want the environment to be extremely different our behavior different, our teachings different. Let me, let me say this, uh, Veronica, just excuse me before you come in. When the queen of Sheba came to Solomon, what did she observe? The Bible talks about several things. I'm just 
I, I, I may not be able to really read it um, immediately. But the Bible talks about several things, that she observed the order of ascent to his palace, to the house of the Lord. He observed his clothing, how he was dressed, his servants, how they were dressed. He observed the food on the table. She listened to the wisdom that Solomon expounded. And that, and that, and that. She brought so much to Solomon. Let me read it. Second Chronicles chapter 9, the verse 9. It says, now when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, she came to Jerusalem to test Solomon with hard questions, having very great routine, camels that bore spices, gold in abundance, and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. So Solomon answered her all her questions. There was nothing so difficult for Solomon that he could not explain to her. I mean, this is Old Testament. The kings of the earth coming to the kingdom to ask questions. And there was nothing so difficult. Please, I want to really, really, really think about my Christianity because I have a lot of questions I've not been able to answer. And what is the experience that Solomon had? Systems that he had around him that he could provide answers to enigmas that even beat the understanding of the one that brought the questions of enigma. Why is the church as if living in a place of ineptitude? Lack of capacity to be able to create change. Why is it so? What is really wrong with us? Are we connected to the right voltage? We are supposed to be raw power, 11,000 volts walking down the market, going through same experience like everybody, same frustration like everybody, but has answers and solutions. The verse three, and when the queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food on his table, the city of his servants, the service of his, his, his uh, waiters and their apparel, his cup bearers and their apparel and his entryway by which he went up to the house of the Lord. His entryway by which he encountered God and experienced God. His, his spiritual pathways. When Solomon lifted his hand to pray, I mean, there was a blast and ambience of spiritual pathways going out. And the queen of Sheba, it's become a spectator and it's just operating, uh, it's just observing and not even saying hallelujahs. She's just watching and listening to the level of wisdom Solomon is speaking back in his ways to God. Mine. The entryway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. I want to stop there. So personally, I arrive at that place and I said, God, um, I used to sing. I used to sing a lot, plenty, 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 plenty. So, um, God, I want to be unique. God, I want to be 40 years ahead of my generation. God, give me something, something, something. I want to just be me. I want to live in my skin. I want to preach differently. I remember telling my, my, my pastor in Assemblies of God those, those days and I told him, I said, I can never be one of your pastors. He said, why are you saying that? I said, the manner in which I want the church that I lead to operate, your laws will not allow me. I remember very young, I was saying this thing. I remember where we're sitting, even till now. He said, why? I said, I want to just be different. Veronica, over to you, dear. Uh, this is a has um, has impacted my life so much because I remember when I went to the studio to see the production manager and we were discussing and he asked me, so very, what do you want? I said, I told him that this is what I want. I don't want what you've been hearing every day on the radio. 
well. I don't want what you've been saying. I don't even want what you've been saying in your head. I want something different. And I am praying to God. I am praying to God to show it to me. Mm. That was more than three years ago. And when he shows it to me, I'll come. I went to the studio. I paid some money. I did some work. I told him, don't publish it. Don't do anything with this. Leave it in. Because I was not convinced that that's what I wanted up to now. Recently, about three weeks ago, he called him. So very when I told him that I'm still not ready. When I when I see or when I get what I'm looking for, he will hear from me. So it's been a battle, a waiting, a waiting battle for years and years and years and years and years. You understand? And I believe that when I hear from God, music is going to change lives. It's going to bring people to the kingdom. It's going to heal. It's going to deliver. It's going to set free. You know, so um, personally, I have no interest in rushing and putting anything out, out there just to be there. No. I, have, I have no intention. I have no passion for that. A friend of mine called me and said, Vero, she had a dream that I had a song on the on social media and it was trending all over the world. I said, that's not my intention anyway, but if it happens, glory be to God. You see, and I know that one day God is going to show me the way. He's going to teach me exactly how he wants it to be. So it's been a waiting game. It's been a waiting game for years, but I bless God that I'm, I'm, I have the ability to wait. Because the Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. I believe he's teaching me something every day as I wait. I'm getting one step closer to what he wants me to do regarding my music. And uh, yeah, so that's where I am, Mark. <laughs> that's where I am. That's where I am. Come on. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a very good one. I... Um, I may just want to say at this um, juncture, maybe this can be one of the very first assignments, and it's going to dovetail into um, the next slides that I'm going to get into. It's not loaded. The next slide is not loaded. They're just straightforward principle, clear principles, things that we can all do, and um, something very important to, to share. But one of the things that I think all of us should do is to go back to God and say, God, show me the dream you are dreaming about me. Show me the dream you have dreamt about me and what you are dreaming about me now. We want to wait on the Lord to hear. We want to wait on the Lord to be instructed. Um, I had a story of a, a medical doctor who is in a kingdom community in Australia. She was instructed by the Lord to resign from her work. Then she heard God clearly. She, had, she has a very strong prophetic grace. And when she resigned, all the money she got, the Lord asked her to buy a particular property. And she did. By the way, um, the pastor who was sharing the story, who, who is this lady's um, leader in the community where she is, said that she is a woman whose visions have defined a lot of the things that he teach. He teaches as an apostle. So sometimes even before a year begins, he will tell the lady, go pray about this particular matter and bring me a word. And the lady could just come and bring just a word, not a sentence, not a story, just a single word. And that word continued to, to redound and give birth to um, several things in the community. So she bought a property, after about three years, the Lord instructed her to sell the property off. So she sold the property off. And then the Lord said, the money you've acquired, go buy these three properties. And she did. Within a pace of three years, she became a millionaire. And her visions that keep dropping in the community continue to define the community so powerfully. A medical doctor. She found what God was dreaming about her and she lived it. And it's important that we step into that space. That will be one of the assignments I would like um, 
to advise and I would like to request of you. Let's all do it this week going forward, this month, the rest of this month. Lord, show me the dream that you have dreamt about me. It doesn't matter if you are 75, you are just starting like Abraham. It doesn't matter if you are 80, Caleb is your companion. If you are youth like Daniel, Daniel is your companion. If you're like Samuel, Joseph, you have a place to fit. All of us have a place to fit within this expression in creating impact. It may be in your little corner, the very little things you do, but it's going to create very huge behemoth of an impact. So who wants to share any other thought before we get into those uh, slides? Zorina says that I love, I am learning this. Who wants to share anything? Who wants to share anything? Claudia, are you there? Have you closed from work? I am. I am. Uh, okay. So um, maybe just before I go into the next slide, um, it will definitely touch something on um, in relation to all of us. So maybe Claudia, you want to you want to share your experience. I shared your story last week, and um, I just said. It would be good to have Claudia share it all by herself because she is living the experience. She could share it with a certain grace that will leave an impact on me or that could just open a spiritual pathway for me or for you. So Claudia, if, mm. if you are cool, then just go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I am. I just feel, guys, that you know me already that I feel like I'm very little to be sharing something among all of you that have such impactful experiences all the time but mark thought that it was worth sharing what's something that happened to me during this month that seemed, that's been happening happening to me during the, this month and that's why i've also been a little bit away in some of the meetings because i've had to um like fulfill some deadlines that are very rigid. Um, and you know, Mark, when you said um, that we need to find new evangelization strategies and, and that God was going to be some, some, uh, somehow create more creative and, mm -hmm. and, and he will do things differently, right? And, and it came to me, our conversation and, and this story that happened to me as well, because it is a new way and it is something new for me as well. Um, and what happened, uh, just to sum it up, guys, just what happened, uh, I, don't, I don't find it. Now I'm starting to find it a bit more extraordinary, but at, in the moment, like three months ago when this happened, I just really uh, thought that it, it was not, nothing very special. Um, it's just that a few months ago I was uh, watching a TV series. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of this TV series called The Chosen. Um, and it's about the life of Jesus and the disciples, but being told in a very different way as all of the stories that I've, I've watched uh, on television. And I was watching it with my mother because I wanted it to, to, to watch it. And, and I realized that the subtitles were a bit like the subtitles, the subtitles in Spanish were a bit off. And so I started trying to contact these people just to see if I could help them because since I'm, I am a translator into Spanish, I, uh, I just wanted to help. But I mean, that was my heart, just wanted to maybe correct the mistakes that I was watching on the screen. And so I, I started uh, trying to connect with these people in the end, uh, just to fast forward three months, I'm not only co like like contributing with them, changing all the subtitles, but I'm leading the team of all these like 30 volunteer translators that are contributing with this series. And, and I don't know why, like I told Mark the other day when I was telling him this story, I look back and I say, why am I here? Like why, like three months and I'm leading a group of people, like th 30 people that are, volunteer translators and I, they have been very very much impacted by the series just as I have been and and you know and and 
And not only that, but the studios that they, it's called Angel Studios, the Angel Studios that is producing this series. Um, I've been talking to the manager, the global languages manager, because he's some sort of my boss uh, in this whole thing. And, and he was telling me one day, he said, Claudia, uh, can you please send me your CV? And I was like, okay. And so I sent him my CV and he said, I just need to create a job for you. I just need to create a position for you here at the studios. And I was like, why? Like, I, I was laughing with Mark because I said, who tells you? Like, nowadays, I, this is the first time in my life that I hear somebody telling me I need to create a position for you. Like, you usually go, like, you're usually the one that needs the job and, and you kind of accommodate to what they want, right? And, and, and not the other way around. And so for me, it was like, like weird. It's very strange. But at the same time, when I look back and I, and I, and I remember the prayers, uh, and just like you said, Mark, the, the dreams of God, like God's dreams for our life. When I look back, I start remembering like the, the, the prayers that, that I told the Lord. Like I've said, Lord, please, um, I want my talents and the abilities that you've given me and the gifts that you've given me uh, to be able to, to use them for impact in the world, not just to make money, not just to sustain myself, but to, you know, like, like not, be, not work only for the money and not, not work only for, you know, having a career just because, uh, like you say, we can have impact in the place where we are and, and in, be it at work or with our families. And so um, this guy tells me this and I'm not, I, I told Mark, I'm not sure if this guy is being real or not. Uh, but but he, he told me that he doesn't want to, um, the word that he used, because we were speaking in Portuguese, he said the word, like, uh, your talent cannot be wasted, something like that. And I was like, talent? For me, something so natural, what I'm doing with the subtitles and correcting and proofreading the subtitles in Spanish, that is like a normal thing that I do. But for them, it seems to be something very special and, and a skill that I've gained during the pandemic. I, I, I got that skill of working with subtitles, which is different from working with just a regular translation of texts. It's a different like world, the subtitle world and the dubbing world. And, and you know, and, and I see the series and I see how it was birthed like the director of this series, the guy went through a major failure in his life. And when I watched his testimony, that's why I wanted to, to watch the series because I watched his testimony in a short video that he did. And he and you could see, you could tell, like inside you could feel that the Holy Spirit was working in his life and that it was something birthed out of a failure, like a human failure. But he said, if I hadn't, if I hadn't had that failure, I would have never maybe gotten rid of the, the pride that I had and the desire for recognition and the desire for, um, for the, like the world, the lights of the world and Hollywood because he's a filmmaker, right? And so he sometimes in some of the videos that I've watched, he says, I dreamt with being in the platform, like a Hollywood platform being applauded by these people and like the, the, big, the big stars in Hollywood. And now I'm so different, like my heart, I don't care about the recognition. I don't care about the, what people say. I just know that God asked me to bring my loaves and fishes and he will make the miracle of the, of the feeding of the 5,000. So he always says that, that phrase that God told him that he, uh, he was able to do impossible math. And, and you know, it, when you look at the whole story, I don't want to get into the details, but when you when you see the whole story, uh, this started as a crowdfunding crowdfunding idea from the Angel Studios. They had the idea of like they they wanted to support this guy Dallas is his name. They wanted to support Dallas, and they said, well, we're gonna support you, but we're gonna raise money through crowdfunding. And so Dallas was like, how? I mean, crowdfunding, we're not going to get even a thousand dollars. We're not, he didn't have any hope. And, and in the end, this is the, 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 um, 
the biggest crowdfunding, they, they got $10 million from people all over the world uh, just for the first, uh, the first um, season. And, and when you start watching the season and you will start watching the episode, it really, you can tell that it, it, it really touches people's hearts. And I've seen so many, so, so, so many, because I'm involved now, not like I'm, I'm working with them. I see all the time comments of people saying that their, 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 their love for God has been like reignited, that um, they, had, they had lost all hope about the church. And now they realize that it's not about the church or a name. It's about Jesus and about, about uh, finding him and, and getting right with him. And so, I don't know. I'm like, I was telling Mark the other day, like, I don't know, Mark, why I'm, I'm here. Like in this, in only three months, I'm in a position of like, uh, like leading this thing. And I don't know. I don't know how how the Lord did it. And, and, and I, I'm so glad that, that Kelvin said that, that it was, we want to see God working. And for me, it's like that with this thing, it's a small little thing maybe when you compare it to all the, the wonderful things that you guys share all the time that happened to you. But I can see the Lord doing it because I look at it and I see, I mean, English is not even my native language as, and you can tell I make mistakes sometimes when I speak. But, but, you know, God has me in this position and people are looking at something in my life that I didn't even know that it was so special. And, and so it's like, like I get emotional because it's like, you can tell it's him. It's not, it's not me doing it. It's like him uh, doing something through me. And so one of the things that I think I didn't tell you that day when we talked, Mark, was that, um, one day I woke up, like last week, I woke up on uh, Wednesday and I had a very strong feeling about praying for this series because uh, th for three weeks, the, the studios, the Angel Studios has had a lot of problems uploading the subtitles in uh, 60 languages. It's, it's being translated in 60 languages and it's for free. So people, even we get emails and messages from people from Iran or people from Africa that have been able to download the app and watch it for free in their cell phones. And, and it has impacted them so, mu so much. And we had been for three weeks, there have been a technical problem in the studios that they couldn't upload the, the subtitle in any language. And, and they were very frustrated and they couldn't find the answer. What's going, what was going on? And so I woke up one day and I, I sent a message to uh, to the group of leaders. The, there is like a Facebook uh, leaders group with all the 60 languages. And, and so I, I told them, guys, I just woke up today with this strong feeling of that we need to pray and get together. The ones that we can get together and pray about this problem, the technical problem that the studios is having. And so we, we, we met on that Friday. I, I had this feeling on Wednesday and then on Friday we met in the, we met in the morning, 10 or 11 people and we prayed. And in the meeting, there was this lady from Finland and she shared and she said, because I told them guys, if you have any other maybe request, like a pressing thing that's going on now, let's take advantage of the moment that we're all together and just pray together. And so this lady from Finland, almost crying, she said that her son was, her son was uh, hospitalized for two weeks. He didn't want to eat anything. He was having a very bad, uh, she said uh, it was OCD, like an OCD, I don't even know really exactly what that is, but I, I guess it's something like uh, mental, you know, like a mental thing an attack or maybe, I don't know if it's spiritual or it's physical anyways, but, but I felt so strongly that I had, I had to pray for this little boy. And so we prayed and five days later, this lady was trying to, to reach uh, out to me in Facebook because she was not my friend on Facebook, but she would really wanted to talk to me. And she sent me photos and she said, Claudia, my son is eating again. And, and, 
and he's like look at him in the photo he she sent me a photo like before and after and the before photo he was almost you could see him he looked like dead like you know he didn't want to eat anything and so for two weeks he was really weak and very bad and then after five days he started eating again and 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 he was with smiling and and all rosy cheeks and and so she was like thanking me and thank and, and she said our, our lord responded our prayers and then the the technical issue was resolved in like i don't know five days also or seven days maybe it was a week later they started uploading a great amount of backlog that they had and so i was telling mark that sometimes we don't he was he was explaining to me that sometimes those like inklings or um, promptings that you feel that sometimes it's not even a voice, but it's something like something inside that really that you can avoid it. It's God, and 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 since for me, as you know, guys, as you know me already, I got out of a very religious and man-centered uh, congregation. It is like a struggle for me to exactly discern when it's God, when it's my voice, when it's who, you know? And so the whole spirit experience for me in these three months has been like, I mean, all of, of, I don't know where this, where this ends, but, but it's like amazing. And, and it's amazing to see all the comments that people leave on their Facebook page saying like all sorts of things, like my son, starting to watch with me and he was away from the Lord and now he he's uh, wanting to read the Bible again things like that that you you know it's not man-made it's, it's something that really uh, you can see God's hand in it and and I was also telling Mark that this angel studio where these guys the guy that told me I really need to create a position for you they're they they're called they have a north star as they call it and they say that they're building a home for stories that amplify light and the light that they mean like they have it in their website it says uh, the light is whatever is true honest they they, they quote the philip the, the philippians verse uh, everything that's true honest noble just authentic and and so i was telling mark imagine if if i were if i were able to work at a in a place like you can use your talents and your skills and the abilities that God gave you. And they could maybe just give you the sustenance, like the money that you need just for sustenance and for helping other people. But you're, you're going to be using your talents and your strength and your everything for something that is meaningful and impactful and not only just for the sake of money. And so I don't know if I'm guys making any sense, but. Yeah, that's what what. Um, that's beautiful. What Mark. That's beautiful. Yes. <laughs> it's interesting what we have in our hand and what God can do with that. Um. Yeah. Before I just continue teaching, uh, whatever that is left, even if uh, it's going to be taught at all. I mean. Kevin and I are chatting in the background and Kevin just said something. He said, God is on this call in such a powerful way to me. That's Kevin's comment. God is on this call in such a powerful way to me. Serena wrote, said, absolutely, your testimony is such a blessing to me. Mm. To me, it's amazing. Amazing. I'm going to touch some nerves in a moment. Zorina comes back again and says, yes, very much so. I believe God is creating um, a, certain, a certain network in the earth. He's provoking certain realities that we all need to walk in. Nobody is useless. All of us carry impact if we have Christ. Um, Claudia just shared something and um, it reminds me of a video I sent to her. Uh, maybe I'll hold it if I can play that video. It's a short video. If I can play that video, 
I will, I will, so that all of us can, can watch it. It's just about Ecclesia everywhere, how individuals can now become a huge source of light brought in, developed and sent out for impact. So I, I have that video somewhere. I'll just, I'll pull it before the end and share. Maybe one, um, one more comment, if any of us want to say something before we get into all of this. And yet says quite clear, Claudia, does make sense. Interestingly, uh, Claudia Aniek is in the same, I think the same industry like yourself. Um, Aniek, I think she does translations too. I don't know whether she does Spanish or French or something, but I know she, she has something to do with languages. Aniek, am I right? If I'm wrong, please correct me. Mm, yeah, so French, English, Spanish, wow. Wow. Kevin, all the books you are writing, come on, consider them translated into French and Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. And then Creole. Wow, that's interesting. So imagine this small room, but with powerful impact that is reaching be, be, across the Caribbean across the Latin America region. Or oh, is it South America? You are in South America, Chile, South America, right? Claudia, am I yes. right? Yes. yes, Chile, South America, yes. Yeah. And but where is Anik? Anik is, um, is in Guadalupe, oh. within, the, within the Caribbean enclave. So imagine, imagine you, the, the translation creating impact within the Spanish speaking um, environment. Imagine what um, Aniek does, creating impact in that environment. Just bringing clarity in the minds of people of the very things written in English. Martin, I see your microphone unmuted. Well, um, good afternoon and night, everyone. Good afternoon. Good uh, Sir Mark, we have not spoken in a while. Yes, hey, sir. brother Kelvin, um, blessings to everyone. Um, I am well, brother. I am very well. It, it is very interesting when I came on and shortly after Claudine started um, sharing. And I remember, because it would have been the last time or the second to last time when I was on and she was on and we prayed for her and and all of that. And I'm, I'm really just, just looking back now and just to hear what God is doing it's 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 amazing it's amazing we too my family and I have somehow gotten into the chosen and I can tell you it is is the first thing I watch and I've been watching Jesus show of course since I've been a boy and I think that certainly has tapped into something and um really really I think God is with him I I just want to probably want to say this to Cla Claudine, Claudia. Mm -hmm. um, yes. we, we we continue to pray for him. I kinda personally, I kinda not like too much of the merchandising, but I guess it's all in the whole movie thing. But 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 certainly I I'm I'm not going into that. But yeah, I think certainly God is doing something amazing with him and certainly connecting him with with um people right across the globe. I, I, I think that what is happening has very little to do with him. He, his heart was in a, in, in a place and, and somehow we tapped into an ongoing stream. So we just need to keep praying for him. And, and so, but I also wanna share, as Claudia spoke about just, just what is happening. And as I just mentioned, there is, there is such a massive stream of ecclesia, the kingdom of God, which is the same thing that is flowing, that is happening, guys, that is mind blowing. I have been asked to serve on a global intercession um, group 
that is called, I don't know if anybody here have heard about them, that is called or RGM, GRM, sorry, GRM, which stands for Global Revival Movement. And um, I got connection with them through a brother who was in Jamaica, he is now in the US. Uh, he sent uh, uh, like a, uh, an invite to the group and I took it on because they were doing something for children, of course. I have two boys, so we went on on it and long and short of it, we got involved and I realized it's actually an intercession group and been on a couple of times with them and they've asked me to serve pretty much to serve with them. And this is a global group that pretty much have work going on all over the world. Uh, they meet three times for the week and I've been on as much as I can. And it has been life-changing. I'm saying this just to make the point that, and, and as Mark says, there's no body at all in the kingdom at this time that will not, if you can position your heart right, that will not be moved, God, that God will not touch and that God cannot use. And I think there's a massive river that is flowing, the stream of God. And if you are just willing and if you can dare to trust him and to allow him to take you into this river, then it will, just like oh, Claudine is in awe of all of what is happening, that she didn't know that was going to happen but God, something, something just passed her or, or, or swept her and um, we're seeing the result. And I think there's just an amazing thing that is happening now right across the landscape of the body of Christ as God um, in a new way um, just, just, just bring all of this together. Also, just want to say very quick too that the, 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 we talk a lot and there's a lot more is now talking about revival. But I think that God, what he's after, and he will use what the people know and what the people has been exposed to, which is revival. And, and the church has been known to be living from revival to revival. And yes, it, 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 it creates a small, let's say a small upstore, but that has not done what the kingdom supposed to do and I think that is God's ultimate so we continue to pray and um really just to open ourselves to God but it is just amazing really good to be on with you guys I've not been on for a while but um, I, I'm really happy so blessings everyone beautiful sir Martin mm -hmm. God bless you sir God yes, bless you brother. so so I'm just going to use the balance of the time to touch on um, something very important that relates to our installation, our ability to put this uh, life out there and express it. I mean, we've seen Claudia, we've seen Kelvin's expression, we've seen Martin's expression. There are different, different, different testimonies out there of what God is taking our ordinary lives um, five loaves of bread, two fishes, to begin to do something of impact for 6,000, 5,000 and all. You never know that somebody is depending on your call to fulfill the destiny that God has called him to do. So let's look at Ecclesia without walls. And let's look at the first one, which is Ecclesia in the home a neighborhood, kingdom sanctuaries. And let me start off by saying that sometimes we try to look at a spectacular, we try to look at a very big thing, the big bang, the, um, the expression like in Elijah's days, I mean, the mountains splitting, the rocks crying, the fire billowing and all of that. We keep looking and searching for God in that reality when he's just existing in the very still small voice expression. And so um, we begin to look at these big things and we forget about the immediate environment of ours and things begin to collapse and fall apart. So the first thing, if we're going to install the Ecclesia in our home, in our neighborhood, then we will need to have this understanding, just this little statement. We are 
the Ecclesia. Me, Kelvin, you, Martin, Claudia, Aniek, Timmy, Veronica, everybody, seen, unseen, known, unknown, conscious of, not conscious of, we are the Ecclesia. Me and my wife and children, we are the Ecclesia. That consciousness must begin to become a big reality for us. If we are going to be able to bring Christ into the neighborhood, into the environment we live in. Because the point is we want to enter into transformation. And in this transformation process, we want to begin to introduce the gospel of the kingdom, the lifestyle of the kingdom, the culture of the kingdom, and the ways of the kingdom. So the first thing we want to underscore is that we are the ecclesia. And therefore that leads us to talk about the principle or the concept of the critical mass, the concept of the critical mass. We all know this concept very, very, very well. It is not far-fetched. It is something that we've quoted on the call before as we describe the nature of the Ecclesia, which um, was underscored in this reality of um, the company of two or three. So in Matthew chapter 18, we read it again, the verse 20. Jesus Christ said, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. That is a very simple statement, but this constitutes the critical mass. In the Roman Ecclesia, they work with something called the critical mass. So Jesus did not just make statement. He made a very strong statement. One of the reasons why they come fighting him because they are wondering if this guy is a political leader who is coming to topple them. One of the reasons why they chased him everywhere, the political folks, because he employed their own language to express spiritual truth and reality that must be prevailing. So myself, yourself, together, we are in the majority. With God on our side, we are in the majority. Says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. We are in the majority. We are in a very powerful majority that nothing can stop. There is no time to go quoting several scriptures. You can even see the expression in the Old Testament. So um, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 13 and 14, we saw this thing about Israel going to war and um, Israel getting stuck and um, um, the King Saul had placed a law over everybody not to eat anything. And so the people began to um, go famish. And then Joshua, sorry, uh, Jonathan, Jonathan and his, his armor bearer. I mean, that whole statement, armor bearer, which has been transposed into all kinds of crazy, crazy, crazy um, 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 oppressive um, slavery systems uh, in, 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 in the body of Christ today. Joshua, uh, J Jonathan and his armor bearer went out and just their movement, the critical mass principle, began to create turbulence in the camp of the enemy and boom, the war was on. You know the story already, how the enemy stood against each other and Jonathan and his servant brought back good news and freed the men who were in servitude because of the command of Saul. Bible says that when... Um, it became apparent that they could eat. They even ate the lamb with the blood. Abuses were, were even unfolded. So the principle of critical mass is, is the point. Two or three. So you want to start from somewhere online. You want to start from somewhere at home. You want to start a community to have a conversation. Two or three. In fact, Kelvin has four already looking through his window. He has four gentlemen. He's targeting and wants to take interest in them and have a conversation with them in a new with a new trajectory towards evangelism. Without necessarily saying Jesus loves you to start with, but a very evident, and we'll see it, a very evident position, a very evident life that uh, must be embraced. So we see also in Genesis, God talking about a critical mass. Where God says that um, um, Abraham and God were interacting and Abraham was asking God, if you find this number of righteous people in the city, will you destroy? God says, I will not. My God, you can begin to even look at that scripture, tie it with the, 
once spoken of in the book of Leviticus, a one shall chase a thousand and two shall chase a ten thousand. Tie them together and begin to look at the impact of our, our righteous standing in our home environment, our society, the little community we live in, in wanting to create impact. Let me repeat that again. Think about our individual righteousness coming together in a company of two, three, little communities, little systems of resistance within our communities, righteous kingdom sanctuaries rising within our community. Think about the conversation between Abraham and God. If you find 10, what will you do? If you find 15, what will you do? Will you destroy? He says, I will not destroy. Just imagine of a negative atmospheric pressure, satanic pressure coming upon the environment, the area you live. And God, God finds two or three. The New Testament now zeroes in on two or three with me, God involved. Ecclesia in the home and neighborhood, kingdom sanctuaries ought to begin to rise. Little groups, little meetings ought to begin to rise. Pastors, church leaders ought to begin to change the model of their meeting to unleash people and put power and put great liberty in the hands of the people they lead to begin to pastor their environment. The concept of the critical mass. Well, if you find 10, if you find 15, will you destroy? God says no. Wow. Jonathan and his armor bearer, just two created huge commotion in the camp of the Philistines. And God is attracted to the critical mass. Maybe that will be the last statement on that point before I move on. God is attracted to the critical mass. Let me run through this. Therefore, when we come to the critical mass, the question we want to ask is, what is that you have in your hand? And this is why I said each and every one should ask God about what he's dreaming about you, what he's dreamt about you, and let's run with it. What is it that you have in your hand? The story is told in John chapter 6. It's also told in the book of Matthew, I think 13 or 14, of a little boy that had two fishes and five loaves of bread. And the principle is, what is it that you have in your hand? If you can trust him and throw it into his hands. I think it's Ave Slaughter that had sung a song. It says, if you have a work to do and the work seems bigger than you, that's when he steps in. And he quoted and talked about this little boy with two fishes of bread. He says he will multiply it. He will take it. He will, he will bless it. He will multiply it. It will grow. It will expand. What is it that you have in your hand? It is time that we go back and begin to dust our gifts again. We begin to dust our purposes again. Some of us have very good skills with, with some special recipe. And that recipe can go global or can affect communities around, can bring real good health, what is it that you have in your hand? You know, my wife tells me, said, me, I'm not a preacher like you. I'm not called to be a pastor and a preacher like you. He says, when you do any flyer, don't put my face there. I'm not a preacher. And thankfully, I mean, I have struggled with flyers that I have put my photos on. I've always said they shouldn't put my photo, but they said we will put it. So this time there are some new flyers that we are doing for the new location. You will not see my, you will not see my face on them. You will just see animated things, very beautiful things out there. And she said, my wife said, she is called to be a kingdom fantasy. And so she wants to focus her effort and energy in that area. She's called to pastor her children. So she wants to focus her energy. She says, I am not a preacher like you. And so it is time to sow what you have in your hand. What is it that you have in your hand? And then this question we must ask and ask and ask and go back to God if we cannot identify anything. God, what is it that I have in my hand? And I want to trust and put it in your hand. So Genesis chapter 26 is a whole beautiful story of, of Jacob going down into Egypt. And 
um, is is it is it Jera? Jera. He went down to uh, he went down to the land of Jera, and then there was famine, and God asked him to stay in the land, and so in the time of famine, and Jacob continued to wax massive, big, and prosper even in the time of famine. This is the time to sow. We must begin to ask for strategic insights. What is it that you have in your head? What you need to plant is your gift, your leadership gift, your gifts of the spirit that the Holy Spirit has given to you. It is time to begin to look for locations and plant them. I'm amazed that, um, um, I mean, Claudia go praying for this little boy who has refused to eat and was almost like a vegetable. And here he is healed and beginning to eat again and is recovering. What is it that you have in your hand? If we're going to be the ecclesia in our homes, the people are not just coming to observe anything, but they are coming to observe Christ manifesting through our giftings and our abilities and our culture and the way we live. It is time that we know we are the ecclesia and we enter into the critical, critical mass um, concept. The Roman society operated by it. They could just take two or three and throw them into society and they are calling for a massive transformation in that society, to the society that has been colonized. So the point I want to make to you and encourage you is that sow your gift into new locations. Sow your gifts into new locations. Sow your gift into dry places like Jacob, Genesis 26. Take time. Take time and read these two, um, these scriptures that are there. Genesis 26, read it. See how Jacob in the time of famine arose to become massive. There has to be something powerful unleashed in the earth. If we continue to be a people that clap our hands, listen to a nice sermon, give a very nice offering, and then we go back to our Christian wives, our Christian husbands, we sleep on our Christian bed, and we... We drive our Christian cars. We take our children to Christian schools. I don't know. Critical mass, each one were skilled people, well-accomplished people. And you and I are well-accomplished people if we have Christ. What is it that you have in your head? So into, into, so your gift into dry places. Become a cereal planter. Just become a cereal planter. Not sowing and throwing before your pearls before the swine, but become a cereal planter. It's one of the reasons, the things that drives me that um, Sundays I could be so tired and almost worn out, but I want to stand behind a camera and speak and teach the word of God because somebody is depending on the sowing of my gift of teaching. And, and I am amazed when I get calls from some People that to me from America, he says, I was just asking who is this young African boy who is speaking so powerfully? And I'm told he's in Ghana. It says, my dear, continue to sow your gifts. People are watching and that thing will bless people. Sow your gift of leadership. Sow your gift of giving. Sow your gift of, of sowing, uh, of, 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 um, 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 capping free, whatever, sow it, sow it. Every natural ability, sow it, sow it. You are not dying now. We cancel all your funeral plans. Sow it, sow it. Number two, there are three principles and I'm, I'm going to end on the third one soon. Number two, and I'll share these slides with everybody. I'm going to share these slides with everybody. I'll share these slides with everybody. Number two, dedicate the place where you live, where you work, where you play. Open your heart and your doors. Because we want to bring the ecclesia, Christ in the neighborhood. So we should find some small space in our home where we invite people to come and sit. We sit over coffee. We talk anything. We sit 
we talk about any, we talk about life. And Christ is excluding and touching lives. Dedicated place. Now, in dedicating a place, I want to touch on a very important thing, and I'll run through this quickly. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Now, how do I dedicate a place? Let me start with that. How do I dedicate a place? You can, you can grab your olive oil, pray over it, anoint your doorpost, command that this place is a gate of heaven. If you do not have, you can lift your hands and pray. Command that this, this environment is the gate of heaven. You open this door to grant access to the heavens and pronounce blessings and release glory. And you will see lives being transformed coming to your home. I'm telling you. So Acts chapter 1, the verse 8, it says that, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be called, you shall be my witnesses. And the word witness is the word matus, not mats, is the word matus, M-A-R-T-U-S, matus, which from which we find the word matai or a record that is a piece of testimony or evidence or the word witness. It said you shall be my matai, you shall be my record, you shall be my witness um, in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Now, there are a number of things when I look at this scripture that jumps at me. Now, the word matai has something significant. So we want to talk about the design of our appointment. Three things, sorry, not two, three things. The design of our appointment. And a, a, a very strong comment here. A true witness is bound up in evidence in conveying and making evident the life, instructions, death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even in the midst of persecution and death, which, which it's produced out of his personal legitimate relationship and encounters with the Lord and conviction of truth. We cannot have ecclesias in our home as a excitement, you know, one of the ways that are going to be that is going to be crucified is the word ecclesia. Just like they did to Cain, they did to the, the word apostle, they did to the word prophet. Now the two ways that are on the path of crucifixion and being abused and misconstrued is the word kingdom and ecclesia. These two words. We're going to hear it in the next decade. It's going to become a commonplace. So it's not about the excitement to go out there but uh, to go out there and establish one, but a true witness is bound up in evidence, in conveying, that evidence is conveying and making evident the life, instructions, the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Even in the midst of persecution and death, which extrudes out of personal legitimate relationship and, and encounters with the Lord, and conviction of truth. We must be a people who are persuaded so that we can be like Solomon. When the questions come, we have answers. Personal, legitimate relationship. Encounters with the Lord. Personal, personal, personal. Just that personal. Um, I read a book. Uh, I still have it on my shelf. The gentleman wrote, it, wrote this fat book out of his personal Bible study he did every day. The title is uh, Praise in His Court by a guy called Andrew Hill. I think he comes out of UK. And the book is fat. He, 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 uh, he is an Old Testament um, 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 professor. But he said he wrote the book out of his personal relationship with God. My God. He says, let's, let's uh, Anik is saying, let's activate the midwives who in turn, who activate for powerful Overnight birthing in the kingdom, close and far. My God, my God. I like that concept. We need the midwives coming. We need them. We need them. We need them. So we need to understand the design of our appointment. The design of our appointment is not one luxury life. It's a matai's existence. It's an existence of a matai. Is that I am a record. I am a little piece of evidence. I am a testament. I am an extension of all of who Christ is and will ever become. In the earth, I am, you are, our setting, our meetings, our gatherings, our little two by two on the street, in the corner of the house, having conversation, we are. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter two, the verse four, 
it says, in the fact, the verse 3 says, how shall we then escape? Of this great salvation, the verse 4, God himself, God himself, confirming and affirming with signs and wonders and gifts of the Holy Spirit as he wills. When we begin to constitute ourselves right, God comes to back it and shows up. Ecclesia in the home. In fact, we can say Ecclesia online, where we can begin to have those conversations. Now, the, the, second, the second thing that I want to touch on, which extrudes out of the design of our appointment. So the design of our appointment is a matter of death. Let me read that statement again. A true witness is bound up in evidence in the conveying and making evident the life, instructions, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even in the midst of persecution and death, this testament, this matus exists and is still testifying. It extrudes. And so that life is hinged on personal legitimate relationship, encounters with the Lord, and personal persuasive conviction of truth. You have to be persuaded. And it's, it's, it's a sum up in this, the quality of our intimacy. So... You read the scriptures in 1 John chapter 1 through the verse 4. It says, that which our, we have seen, that which we have been with, our hands have handled, we make, we make available to you. Our fellowship is of the Father, it's not corrupt, so that you can enter into this fellowship. The quality of our intimacy. 1 John 1 verse 1 through 4, and I think there are other verses there. That speaks of our fellowship is of the Father. And thereby we share this fellowship with you so that you can also enter into this fellowship. That is what happens in the ecclesia, in the neighborhood and at home. It becomes, it becomes shared life. It becomes evident life being impacted. Apostle Paul says that we were among you like nursing mothers impacting our very lives. So you, you, in, in, in the ecclesia, in the neighborhood at home, we can see um, just a natural setting, the children jumping and the children arguing over what. And sometimes husband and wife may disagree on something, but the maturity plays in. Ecclesia, the home. Let me touch on, let me touch on the, the, next, the next one real quick. Wow, my screen wouldn't move. My screen is frozen. Let me touch on the next one real quick. Listen to this. Ecclesia in the home and neighborhood, kingdom sanctuaries. I will talk about this briefly, the quality of inner life. Let me read that scripture. It's Galatians chapter one, the verse 16, the verse 15 through 16 and 17. Galatians chapter one. Galatians chapter one. The quality of inner life, quality of inner life. There's no time to really go into this. You know, some of the dangerous places we live is our thoughts. One of our friends, Matik, posted something um, on a platform in which we, we, we are on where, where we do not even guide our thoughts, the quality of inner life. What is really happening in our inner life is important because that thing will be made evident in the household of the Ecclesia. Verse 15, Galatians. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal, the verse 16, to reveal his son in me, the quality of inner life, to reveal his son in me, to patent his son in me, to make manifest his son in me, that I might preach him. Preach, the word preach is not about just shouting, but I might make evident and showcase and make manifest. That is the word preach before the word, before speaking, that I might make manifest evident and showcase him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned uh, again to Damascus. The quality of inner life. It says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. And let me just touch on that. Now there's something personally I'm getting bothered on. I'm getting bothered. Please permit me five minutes, I'm done. Getting bothered about. And that is, I was sharing with Claudia. You know, growing up, um, I am the only child between my dad and my mother. So what it means is that my dad had 
other children, but I'm the eldest. So he had other children. My mother had other children before meeting my dad. So I am the only child between my dad and my mother. Um, so as I was growing up, my other siblings, my father's children were not close by, but my mother's children, I'm extremely connected with them. We relate very well. But my father's children, because of the circumstances, you just imagine living a uh, hey guy and um, Sarah living together and imagine all the confusion that continues. So um, they, were, they were living somewhere in the village and the issues of envy and all of that. So one was parceled and sent down, who is the one that comes early after me. And we started relating very well. Something happened when we were growing up. He insulted me. He insulted me. And it's, it's almost as if some insults, you know, sometimes people insult people and they just get angry. When they insult somebody as a fool, you start seeing that. I don't know how a fool looks like the image, but you start seeing and feeling that thing. And you start acting it if you are not self-controlled. So he insulted me, said some derogated things to me, really, really violated my emotions, really violated my space, hurt me badly. And I felt that I have the right to be angry. And in my mind, I decided to severe him off. I cut him off completely. Several, several years ago, we were very young. Cut him off completely. And so as I'm studying and looking at Ecclesia in the home, Ecclesia without walls, and I'm looking at Jesus saying that we have to be in, we have to start the Ecclesia from Jerusalem, the impact from Jerusalem. I began to think about God what this thing can do to me by healing me and healing this relationship with my, my, this particular brother. There are other two that comes after him, another guy, another gentleman and a girl. We talk here and there, but the relationship does not have any fire really there. That, I mean, Christmas can come, come, come by. I may not even pick the phone to say, Merry Christmas to you. That is how serious it is. And I just want to share that and I don't know where somebody is, you may have to consider your Jerusalem because it's an instruction from the Lord. And um, lastly, lastly, okay, so number two, we said dedicate a place. Um, okay, I've jumped over this. Let me just go back to it. The number, number three is a very simple principle here. Number three is a very simple principle, but very powerful, and I want us to embrace it. Number three is this, adopt your neighbors. Adopt your neighbors, adopt your community, adopt your city, adopt the area you live in prayerfully. And what it means is that you want to begin to release prayer, dislodge the atmosphere, begin to pronounce blessings in the community. Um, so if um, I live in a city uh, like California and then I live in, uh, um, like Kevin lives in LA, then he lives, he lives in this particular locality, this particular area. Kevin, you may want to begin to adopt your your neighbors and begin to speak over the environment. You begin to take authority over the environment. And that is one of the major things the Ecclesia in the home ought to begin to do. That when we would have gathered together and we offer prayer, we want to begin to sow into the environment and uh, adopt our neighbors. God bless you, friends. I want to stop here. Our time is fast spent. It's 10 minutes past our usual hour. And it's been super, 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 super. Bless you. God bless you. I'm done. Maybe one or two comments and we are out of this place. I'll send um, the slides out to everybody. I'll send a recording. Um, I'll, we'll upload them on YouTube as well as um, on the podcast and we'll share everything um, by God's grace today. God bless you, friends. Okay. I just want to thank you for this. I want to thank you for this, Mark. Thank you very much. It's a lot to, to chew on. It's a lot to process. It's a lot to digest. And um, I just want to echo what you said and encourage everyone as what we will do as you admonished. Ask God what has his dream been about you. Ask him to reveal his dream to you, about you. And, and that's very, very powerful. So I really appreciate it. And uh, I, I, wanna, I saw somebody in the, in the chat talking about praying for one another and, and you know, carrying each other in our hearts. I think mm -hmm. that's a very, very important thing, mm -hmm. particularly in this season. God has brought us together for a reason, for a season and for a purpose. 
and uh, I don't want to miss any of it. Beautiful, beautiful. And we want to want to re-echo that. Please, let's carry one another in our hearts. Names that you can remember, mention them. And as you mention the one you remember, God knows the one you could not remember, but you carry them in your heart and you offer prayers, you speak over them. I think next week, if we, God permits, um, we could go on teaching. I could begin to look at the Ecclesia in a marketplace, but I'm going to slow down on that a bit. I'm going to slow down a bit because it can be very discursive and also I want to encourage, let's all get into this search and let's all bring our offerings together next week. And as we talk about these things, we're just going to get into this room, we share something and we talk about all these things and get so provoked about what God is doing in our hearts and where he's bringing us individually, um, gifts and talents and abilities and purposes that we are discovering in our world, um, missions and communities on missions, families on missions, uh, um, um, goals that God is placing before you as an individual families. We're going to begin to discuss this. It could be business project. There could be community transformation project, new evangelism strategies. We could get into all of this. So I'll share the slide. Let's look at the slide again. Listen to this teaching again. It's, it's, it's very simple and not long, but kind of loaded. It's kind of loaded. And I think we want to drill it down. We give next week to it to drill it down. Now, um, next month, next month, next month on the 19th, which is a Thursday, we're going to have NS Paul out of Nigeria speak to us. My dear friend NS Paul out of Nigeria will be speaking to us. And then on the first, first Thursday of um, September as well, he's available and he will be speaking to us as well. I think that is um, 2nd of September. So there's a flyer on that. We'll be posting it when um, 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 it's drawn nearer. God bless you, friends. Um, I am done. Claudia, God bless you. And yet, God bless you. Um, may God take this offering and do something with you all. God bless you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We want to be out of here. Let me let me also turn my video on so that I can see you can see me. Until such time as this arm to our source be revealed. Your Honor, with all due respect to you, this God bless you. God bless you, Kevin. God bless you. Big hugs to everybody. Yeah. God bless you. Send my love to Brenda Kelvin, please. We'll, we'll do. I promise to do it. She asked about you all the time, Claudia. Yeah. I, I want her to hear this testimony. Oh, this she testimony was not. She, awesome. Oh, thank you so much, brother. Yeah. yeah. God bless you, Claudia. It's good to see you and, and to have you on today. The testimony was thank powerful. God bless everybody. Just love you, family. This is great. This is great. Love you guys. You. Love you all. Zorina, God yeah. bless you. Good evening. <laughs> bye, bye, bye. Okay, bye, bye. for now. Yeah. Tell me good night. Bye. Okay. Good night. Good night.